Good afternoon, everybody. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that uh, this event will be going to be live streamed and also recorded. So, welcome all to our university, the University of Nicosia. On behalf of the university, the Digital Innovation Department, and the Institute of the Future, I would like to welcome you all here. Actually, I should say good morning, good afternoon, uh, uh, good evening, wherever you are in the world, since we have also our online uh, people. I will, uh, I will say that this event is co-organized uh, with Zero, uh, which is a crypto gateway based in uh, Switzerland. And it's a pleasure to have with us today also as a keynote speaker the uh, co-founder and CEO of Zero, Mark Taverner. And also along uh, with me today, we have uh, Christiana Aristidou, one of the uh, top layers in Cyprus on cryptocurrencies. My colleague and also another top uh, lawyer in Cyprus uh, on cryptocurrencies, Haris Savidis and Giriagos Karalambus from Dominica. So I would like to welcome you all. I will, uh, well, I guess I forgot to introduce myself first. <laughs> Let's see, this is moving. Valentino, this is not moving. All right. Oh, okay. So I'm uh, Professor Sula Luga. I'm the head of the Digital Innovation Department and one also of uh, the directors for the Institute for the Future. I will briefly present to you what we have been doing the past years in the area of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies since we were the first university in the world to actually offer an academic degree in the area. And uh, we are considered to be one of the top universities in these uh, topics. And also briefly go over what uh, you should be expecting to see from us in the near uh, future. All right, but one might actually ask why blockchain and cryptocurrencies? The area of uh, cryptos and uh, blockchain technology in general, it has been a big part of our lives since uh, 2013. We, we consider blockchain to be one of the top um, technologies of the last uh, decades as it increases trust, security, transparency and uh, traceability, delivering cost savings and um, new efficiencies. Moreover, as we see, it has applications in several sectors, in supply chains, in finance, healthcare, retail, and of course, in real estate, which is what we're, what we're going to be uh, talking about today. In addition to this, uh, blockchain is also one of the key uh, technologies for the metaverse, what some might also call the new internet, but um, it slowly started to emerge and we're expected to see a lot more applications in metaverse in the, in the near future, um, where basically we have the physical and the digital worlds merging together. All right. A little bit on uh, our evolution and um, history. We started our journey back in uh, 2013 when we were the first university in the world to accept Bitcoins for the tuition fees uh, for the students. Soon afterwards, actually at the time we all made the news, the Forbes all over the world, uh, Forbes and uh, lots of different other uh, worldwide um, uh, forums uh, that we actually accepted Bitcoin at the university. Soon afterwards, the following year, we launched an academic course, a free MOOC that was offered to everybody. It's still being offered twice tw uh, until today, twice a year. And uh, so far, more than 100,000 uh, people have taken this all over the world. Within the same year, we worked on an application on uh, issuing blockchain-based uh, uh, blockchain uh, certificates. We continued, uh, we launched also our first, uh, our academic degree, the master's degree in blockchains and uh, digital currencies. And we had our first master graduate students. 
In the following years, we continued with research uh, and uh, coll building collaborations with the ecosystem and other universities around the world and uh, issuing also uh, continuing uh, with our spin-offs in um, NFT valuations and um, and, then, and the self-verifiable uh, uh, certificates. And back in uh, 2020, we launched the Digital Innovation uh, Department to actually focus on transformative technologies. And as a consequence, oops, as a consequence of that, you know, and uh, since um, it followed sort of uh, a natural way of evolution, we are start we started to work on uh, metaverse, and we have our open metaverse initiative. Last uh, semester, uh, we had another free course on uh, NFTs and metaverse. That was actually uh, uh, we actually had more than twenty two thousand participants in that. And of course, several other uh, uh, initiatives in this in this open metaverse uh, initiative that uh, we have. We have been active, as I said, in research with the open uh, with the Magridaki's Open Forecasting Center, the Distributed uh, Ledgers uh, Center, the NFT evaluations, and lots of projects from the ecosystem and um, the European Union. Lots of collaborations with. Uh, the, uh, with more than 50 uh, institutions from all over the world. And of course, our service to society, which includes uh, our educational part, advisory, we're advisors to the European Central Bank, to the um, EU Sandbox, the House of the Parliament, and uh, active with uh, various events, conferences, and competitions, and also in, in terms of community offering. We have our uh, chapters, which right now we have more than 40 chapters around the world, where basically we're trying to get the community, the community together, uh, organize all this, what we refer to as the blockchain enthusiast. And I will just briefly skip this since I think I'm running out of time. And uh, our people, uh, collaborations, of course, also with the uh, links with the metaverse uh, community, our full time faculty, visiting and administrative uh, uh, visiting faculty, other unique faculty that we are collaborating, and with world class um, experts. So that's it from me. Enjoy the event. And I would like to um, ask uh, to join me, uh, Mark Tavernen. Mark? Thank you, Sula. Thank you, Sula. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to tell you a sad story to start with. It's a story of $28 million. 2014. I was working with one of the world's largest Bitcoin mining companies. The price of Bitcoin was about $120. And I had a decision to make. Did I take the fee that I was getting as a consultant from this mining company in Bitcoin? Or did I take it in fiat, US dollars? I made the wrong decision. And today, as I stand here, the price of that decision to me can be counted with today's current price of Bitcoin at $28 million. So education, which I didn't have then, is really important. And I promised myself that I would learn as much about this market as I could, so I didn't make the same mistake again. To my mind, education is the most important thing about new technologies. And it's no coincidence that we're here today with the University of Nicosia, who are, in my opinion, the leading global lights in trying to spread education about blockchain technologies, about cryptocurrencies, and about something that is now called Web3, which I don't know too much about because I'm not sure that too many people even know how the internet properly works yet, let alone Web3 on top of it. My background, as I mentioned, is 2014, started working with a company called Bitfury, the world's biggest Bitcoin miner. I did that until the European Commission asked me to found a trade association called Inatba to represent the blockchain industry and negotiate all of the regulatory frameworks that came out of the European Commission 
the European Parliament just recently. And I got a little bit bored of doing not-for-profit because it's very hard work. It's a lot of work and it's not very profitable. So with a couple of colleagues, we founded Xerof. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what Xerof is. But uh, firstly, let me tell you the reason we founded Xerof. We are all crypto dinosaurs, the founders of Xerof, as you can probably tell, you know, I'm not 18 years old anymore. Uh, and we came together to try and solve a problem that we had ourselves. The problem we had was we had a reasonable amount of crypto, not huge amounts. I'm not CZ from Binance. I'm not one of the founders of Coinbase, but enough for it to warrant gaining some education about how we could use crypto in a compliant, frictionless way to buy property. We couldn't find a way of doing it with any party that we could trust. So we set about building a suite of processes ourselves in relationships with banks and tried to find the most compliant way of using our crypto to buy property. We did that very successfully on two properties. And then our friends came to us and said, that seemed to work really well for you guys. Would you do it for us too? And we kind of went, yeah, but it takes some time. So we did a couple of transactions for our friends and then their friends started to come and suddenly we realized we had a business. So now what we do is Xerof. And for those of you that either might be dyslexic or might be very highly intelligent, it's Forex backwards. We based ourselves in Switzerland, which is the only place where there's a regulatory license that currently exists that you can operate to. And we started building this business. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit uh, about what we've built and why we do it. If I can get this to my points, yes, there we go. So we are a business overseen and licensed by FINMA, which is the Swiss Financial Services Authorities. Therefore, we have a license which ensures that the transactions that we run are compliant. They work according to the law and they'll stand the test of scrutiny. But just because we're based in Switzerland doesn't mean that we don't service clients from around the world, we do. The only exceptions are where there might be sanctions or where we might have issues with certain regulatory developments, for example, with what's happening in the US at the moment, if anyone is following that. Uh, we're a little cautious about dealing with US citizens. We provide a broad suite of services, but what I want to talk about today specifically are the services for real estate. So it is true that as well as supporting high value transactions for real estate, for things like collectible jewelry, collectible cars, we also run what we call an OTC, an over-the-counter desk, which is where we allow family offices, institutions, or very wealthy individuals who want to buy into crypto to come to us and to buy, for example, Bitcoin, that has been just mined and therefore has no bad history with it, and also comes from renewable energy sources. So that's the on-ramp piece of the OTC desk. The off-ramp is where we have very wealthy crypto individuals who want to get fiat, US dollars or euros, because they need that money for, I don't know, buying a property or funding a business. We also provide merchant services to allow companies to accept payments in crypto. Uh, and we give, advice and institutional services to very large institutions around the world. But the main topic of today's session that I want to share with you just for a few more minutes briefly is around what we've built to satisfy the purchase of real estate. Uh, and the, this goes back to the very reason why we set up Xerof. We wanted to use our crypto directly to buy property. And all we heard everywhere was, no, you can't do it. No, you can't do it. We don't know how to do it. You'll never be able to do it. So we built this service. And really simply, all we do is we exchange crypto into euros, for example. We send those euros to a third party bank account. So the account of a notary or a solicitor or a property developer to satisfy the purchase of an asset of a house or a piece of land under contract. So the contract is agreed in euros, as every contract is between the buyer and seller. And once that agreement is reached, 
we go to the buyer who has the crypto. We tell them how much crypto they need to give us. We run the exchange. And in usually about two days, we settle into euros in this example, or, or fiat currency, for those of you who don't know what fiat currency uh, is, a third party bank accounts. And it's no, more, it's no more complicated than that. So we've addressed what we saw as a big friction in the market where individuals, and some of you might be those individuals or you might know individuals like this, have crypto and they want to buy property. But many people are saying, no, we can't take crypto. And the crypto holders sitting there thinking, I can't change it into euros easily. So <laughs> it looks like we can't trade. It's not rocket science. I would love to stand here and tell you that we've built an algorithm that's going to solve the world's problem with a piece of great technology that's going to make everybody rich. It's nothing like that. It's a really simple business process under a license in Switzerland that allows real estate professionals to access the crypto market and crypto holders to use their crypto to buy a property. And we sit in the middle and do the exchange. Super simple stuff, but addressing a very big market friction. So that's a, who we are. That's what we do. And we're going to have a little discussion uh, in a little while after Christiana has spoken about various topics that come up in the market, such as, is it legal? Why are there so many Ponzi schemes and illegal actors in crypto? What is the legal situation in Cyprus? But first... I just want to draw attention to the real importance of partners and partnerships. We're here today because I'm fortunate enough to have built a great working relationship with the university through the work I did with INACTPA, the trade association. And we've built great partnerships with, I see some friends and faces in the room here today, but in particular with Christiana, who showed the first early faith in the service we have. Uh, and Abdokia, who's sitting here, is. Uh, a powerhouse of the future. So people watch out for this lady. <laughs> she is going to be telling us all what to do in just a few years time. But the power of partnerships, the value of partnerships in this market is really important. And I'll leave you with just a reminder that the entire crypto ecosystem is built on open source principles, which is everything is there for everybody to use. There's very little IP protection on the software and the code that powers this industry. And the concept is everybody comes together to bring their expertise, get value for their expertise, but collaborate in an open way. So with that spirit of collaboration, I'd like to invite Christiana to come and address you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, who is one of our most trusted partners and oldest partners here in Cyprus. Well done, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, do you mind if I do it from here? Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Before I move on to discuss the crypto opportunity in Cyprus real estate from a legal perspective and real estate perspective, uh, I want to thank the organizers, um, Zirov and the University of Nicosia for the invitation to speak at this very interesting event. <clears throat> So for those who don't know me, I'm Christiana, and I have been working in law, business, and technology for many years, like 25. Uh, in fact, more than half of which I have been closely following the developments in the crypto, crypto space, um, crypto asset sector. Um, so are there opportunities in the Cyprus real estate industry, yes. Incredible crypto opportunities, which call for new ways of thinking about growth um, and reach to new investors, new investor bases, if approached with a compliance first mindset. I have, I have been telling you this for months. So I don't want to duel in to the importance and size of, of real estate you all know. You're here because you do know. So um, the real estate in Cyprus is 
I want to focus though on the opportunity of crypto and blockchain based transactions. Cryptocurrencies have been around for over a decade now. Um, crypto based transactions are a proven way of moving value around in a fast and trusted way. The crypto market has moved past the testing um, stage, let's say, the testing stage of. And, and, and has matured into, I would say, a sizable industry. So based on available evidence that we've got <clears throat> from exchanges um, and uh, trading platforms, um, protocols, blockchain protocols, there is a significant number of crypto users <laughs> actively trading investing and using cryptocurrencies to settle transactions and regardless the regardless of of potential fluctuations that you currently see um in their value and trading crypto assets offer enormous opportunities for fast transparent and secure execution of transactions and recording data Thanks to the underlying technology, as you know, blockchains, the DLT technology, distributed ledger technology. So indeed, the EU uh, aims to create an excess of laws that will regulate DLT-based uh, assets of various types by passing numerous directives, regulations to that end, laws. Therefore, the crypto opportunity is not a distant prospect, but a very real. Currently, it is a very real and very current chance for many industries to expand, including the real estate industry. So it is within this context and framework that I'm here today at the always innovative University of Nicosia and forward-thinking University of Nicosia to talk about how crypto can alter the real estate industry in Cyprus. I will focus on two main opportunities, although there, there are many. So I will only refer to two today. So one is the purchase of real estate using cryptocurrencies, as Mark said. And the second one I will be talking about is the tokenization of property or not just property, but sometimes property related rights or interests. So with the tokens being purchased with either crypto or fiat, depending on the buyer's choice, of course. So as I explained, we currently have a significant number of users that come to us, they ask us, including early crypto enthusiasts, investors, traders, and other real uh, and other retail owners holding cryptocurrencies in their wallets, often a great value, who wish to bring these cryptocurrencies to the real world, so to speak. So since these currencies have value, they want to spend them. They want to spend them on real life assets, like real estate or any other luxury items anyways. So these crypto owners therefore want to use the cryptocurrencies to buy real estate property. A great number of them are high net worth individuals seeking to spend their cryptos on tangible property. So this creates a new and sizable stream of real state clients, isn't it? So, so the, hence the opportunity, this new opportunity, which you developers and realtors can benefit from. So with a reputable network of real estate professionals, and I see a few really uh, professional professionals here now, really who are really deep into real estate and I know some, I see some faces here. So Cyprus with such professionals may attract 
such crypto owners interested in owning property. So this opportunity of selling on real estate to crypto owners does not come without challenges, of course. So one of the main objectives of developers is to receive the purchase price in fiat, as Mark said before. So what is a fiat money? It's any money which is recognized by a central bank of a state. So fiat money, regardless um, of whether the buyer pays in cryptocurrencies. So this is what the sellers want. They want to get that in fiat in their bank account. So this means that a provider must successfully convert, convert this amount, um, these cryptocurrencies to fiat money in a way that allows the transfer of the converted fiat money to a traditional bank account. So based on our experience, and because of the so many um, crypto users and crypto owners, crypto ho cryptocurrencies holders, um, we see, we saw that the possibility of placing crypto derived, crypto derived income within traditional bank accounts is directly, is directly connected to the compliance of the provider uh, of the crypto to fiat exchange service that you use. So with all applicable laws, they must comply with all applicable laws, all applicable regulations, um, and even uh, several technical standards relating to anti-money laundering, checks that they have to conduct, and controls. So one of the main reasons banks are reluctant to accept crypto transactions and crypto derived ink income in traditional bank accounts is this. What is this? Money laundering, the risk of money laundering associated with crypto assets and crypto um, crime. If proper checks are not conducted or carried out properly. So currently the EU Why doesn't change? I can't change it. Valentino. Mm -hmm. So currently, the EU um, and Cyprus have a regulatory framework. They so called the ML five for money laundering, which obliges providers of services relating to cryptocurrencies and crypto assets, um, the so-called crypto asset service providers um, in abbreviation of CASPs, to carry out AML checks and controls to their crypto asset clients and the relevant, relevant crypto asset transactions. Notably, the EU, for you to know, uh, wants to further enhance this framework by introducing new, even, even stricter rules for the transfer of crypto assets, AML6, that it will be coming, AML6 package, new AML laws, even stricter AML laws. So to put in simple terms, <laughs> a main legal challenge facing transactions with uh, made with cryptos, both, I mean, crypto to crypto and crypto to fiat, is the execution of robust and strict anti-money laundering checks and controls with effective KYC. What is KYC? Know your client, know your customer, but also KYT, know your transaction. So also transaction monitoring they have to do and also follow and conduct the necessary checks and necessary monitoring for the travel rule, which is a new um, regulation uh, that has been implemented. So in other words, providers offering um, services relating to crypto assets must ensure that they offer solutions. So that is why we're discussing zero here, that you must ensure that you use solutions uh, that, first of all, ensure the identification 
an assessment of the client seeking to make crypto related transactions. And you are the source and links of the crypto assets in question to avoid risky and opaque, I would say, connections, continuous monitoring of crypto transactions to flag, as per the AML, <coughs> flag um, risky situations and effective travel rule to discern the transferor and transferee of crypto transactions. So this is a travel rule. So it is the, the utmost important of the utmost importance that developers and real estate um, professionals who wish to exploit uh, the opportunity of transacting uh, with crypto owners use a solution. What kind of what kind of solution? One that ticks all the boxes. So they need to use one that ticks all the boxes in this way. They can be sure that the crypto crypto derived income has undergone all the required checks and controls. So, and then secondly, they are more likely to have the money derived from the crypto transaction placed in their traditional bank account. So that's it, in fact. So having in mind that there is currently a growing market for crypto owners mm -hmm. who want to buy real estate and other luxury goods, items. Having in mind that most developers are interested to receive the value of cryptocurrencies via traditional uh, banking channels so that they can pay. We you know why? Because they want to pay the people that work for them, for them like salaries, constructors, and um, other real estate professionals. Having in mind that any services involving the exchange from cryptocurrencies paid by interested buyers to fiat money received by developers and other sellers of real estate can only be offered with strict compliance to AML rules and regulations currently in place um, at an EU level. Having in mind that compliance with AML rules and regulations is challenging for many providers, and having in mind that strict compliance with all applicable laws and regulations is effectively a prerequisite for the placement of fiat <laughs> money with the traditional banking system. Having in mind all of this, we had to, we carried out deep research into the available solutions in the industry for the sale and purchase of real estate through cryptocurrencies paid by buyers converted to fiat money and received as such by real estate sellers. So our aim was to find a solution that would bridge the gap. A solution that would bridge the gap between people used to operating and doing business differently, the crypto owners who are used to transacting and want to pay in cryptos, and real estate sellers that operate in the traditional banking system. This gap would regrettably hinder the opportunity to take real estate into, into, into new areas, into new markets and new investor bases with further reach and incredible prospects. So we had to find a solution. So considering the framework, this framework, we realized the need for law regulation and compliance experts to bridge the gap between crypto individuals and more traditional professionals. And after, I, after we did this research and our assessment, we found zero. <clears throat> so we found that zero is one of the best solutions that manages to tick the relevant boxes, as I said before, for an effective crypto to fiat exchange solution that is tailored to real estate sales and purchases. Hence, our collaboration with Zero as the hybrid low tech firm comes into place at this exact point that we needed to bridge this gap 
and provide meaningful solutions to clients and tangible results. So Zero executes real estate transactions in crypto, settling directly to the developer sellers in their local bank account. To do so, they deploy, as Mark said, they deploy a secure and compliance first solution. They are an authorized entity in Switzerland, as you know already, and rely on a nexus of valuable partnerships with other trusted providers in banking and finance. Um, they implement a business model with real people behind the AML, KYC, KYT checks, combining the power of technology and the experience of their professionals to deliver effective and robust compliance <laughs> results. So what it is zero does is often an AML and KYC solution to support the crypto to fiat exchange, especially for high net worth individuals. So in doing so, it enables the fiat money, as I have said several times, uh, to be placed within the traditional banking system. So as I just said, most providers and solutions struggle with the demand of the developers to receive the purchase price in their bank account precisely because they fail to understand. So it is also about education. It fail, they fail to understand the legal and regulatory challenges and consequently fail to account for uh, and guard against them. So absent a tested and functional solution like the one proposed by Zero, the real estate market would not take um, advantage of the constantly increasing interest of crypto owners to buy property using their cryptocurrencies and the, and the concurrent interest of developers and sellers to get the value in fiat money in their local bank account. So Zero has precisely mastered a model that manages to exchange cryptocurrencies for fiat money and procure the transfer uh, of fiat money to traditional bank account. So, The second crypto opportunity in real estate that I referred to at the beginning is tokenization. So what is tokenization? Tokenization is the breaking down process of real life assets or interests in such assets, interest in such assets. Uh, so um, into tokens, tokens on blockchain, tokens built on blockchain. These blockchain-based tokens can therefore represent real life assets like property, like, like real estate. They can represent shares in a company, bonds in a company. So you may issue like, tokens, which are bonds with which you raise finance, you raise finance to develop property. So shares in company or participation rights in the profits of a company that owns the property. The idea behind breaking down assets into tokens is what? Why do we break down assets into tokens? because in this way we achieve fractionalization, meaning creating tokens representing asset fractions. So to avoid, to avoid a more theoretical discussion, let's dive in quickly, and I'm, 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 I'm almost over. Let's dive into real life, one real life example. Let's assume that the real estate developer has a plot, a plot of land. They want to develop into an apartment building. The cost of construction, let's say, is one million. Instead of reaching out to one investor who will purchase this apartment building, the developer wants to reach out to smaller investors like retail investors or more investors as opposed to one investor, a single investor. So through, they want to do that through the internet via, 
via a tokenization platform which attracts these kind of investors. They know they exist. They attract them. They know they are tech savvy. They, they, they want to buy tokens. So that's um, in, in this way, they give them the chance to onboard. They onboard them on the platform and through the onboarding, then they buy these tokens. This smaller or more investors will get a piece of the land and the apartment building. Developers may purchase or hold the plot of land under a company established as usually we call it a special purpose vehicle or a special purpose vehicle for others. So the company can then create tokens representing shares or the right to participate in the company profits and offer um, to investors like profits. Um, they, they, they offer them to investors to raise the, the construction. They offer these tokens to the investors to raise the construction cost, which, as I said, one million, I said, for the sake of the example. In return, investors will receive the profits arising out of the management of the apartment of the apartment building, the whole building, let's say, once constructed. How? Oh, through the renting of the apartments in one way, let's say. So this example is only one of how developers can tokenize property alternatively. For example, they can create real estate funds to manage many properties, not just one. And they could tokenize what? The units in the funds. So many different tokenization models can be developed uh, involving, in fact, various different legal arrangements that could fit the wishes and plans of real estate developers and owners. Hence, let us know your plan. What is your plan? We may be able to assist you with your business plan. So I wanted to give you a simple example to demonstrate the benefits of real estate tokenization. So have we done it? Maybe you will ask, have we done it? Yes, we have already. Yes, we have done it. Are we dealing with projects as this one I have described? Yes, we are dealing with a number of real estate tokenization involving various different legal arrangements, not only in Cyprus, but also abroad. And we have directly direct relationship with the regulators in other countries in order to do everything perfectly legal-wise, business-wise, technical-wise, and everything. So what do we achieve? One may ask, what do we achieve with real estate tokenization? We achieve, as you see, as you understand, open access to large pool, large pool of investors with global reach. The platform is open everywhere in all the countries. Techs have individuals, investors, just they onboard the black platform and they buy. Access to real estate ownership to retail investors. Until today, they didn't have the chance to buy. So such access is significant today, considering some younger but tech savvy individuals cannot purchase whole properties. What else, what we achieve? We achieve to attract investors who are seeking to combine real estate and sustainability. Also, we achieve liquidity to a current illiquid market. Real estate market is characterized by illiquidity. So token buyers can, subject to requirements, sell their tokens on secondary exchanges, meaning investors have an exit point when they get, when they buy those tokens. Blockchain offers security, transparency, and automatic and fast execution. Transactions with tokens built on blockchain benefit. Uh, from these features, and also we do get such flexibility in asset arrangements. So having said this, I'm happy <clears throat> to announce that um, 
the hybrid blockchain firm, Grant Thornton Blockchain Cyprus, and the Zoltar Agency have formed the Future Estate Alliance, specializing in real estate tokenization. We do believe in tokenization and its potential to facilitate flexibility in asset arrangements and provide for an inclusive and eco-sustainable real estate market development. And we aim at groundbreaking opportunities for real estate growth, promoting the digital transition of the property sector and encouraging a more dynamic asset ownership for large pools of investors. Within this context, we are building the go-to platform, Future State Alliance, built on blockchain and using smart contracts for asset tokenization of any type, no matter the complexity and particulars of each project. We create digital asset tokens representing ownership or, as I said, any other interests in property or pro portfolios of properties. And we're launching this platform officially within the following days. Navigating this area is, in, is a new and potentially complex, <coughs> but made easy with the combined efforts and expertise of the hybrid low tech firm as leaders in law, business and technology, Grant Thornton blockchain with expert practice <coughs> in business and technical development and the Zoltar agency for novel marketing needs emerging in crypto space. So we aim to be the single point of contact and services for the business, legal, regulatory, technical and marketing um, needs of our clients. So we are currently in talks with Zerof for our collaboration regarding our tokenization platform as regards to high net worth individuals. We are confident that our, our real estate tokenization platform and services model as a unique proposition in the real estate market will benefit from such collaboration with Zerof, which has successfully built a truly unique uh, tested and effective solution for crypto to fiat purchases of real estate. So I'm done. Um, we, uh, a panel will follow if you. If you do have any questions, please just post them to us. We would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder. I just want to make a reminder. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Stop. Um, just to say that uh, this is going to be an interactive session, so I will kindly ask also our online participants to use the Q&A Zoom uh, in the Zoom to post their questions, and we will be monitoring them from here. Super, thank you. Aris, Kiakos, would you mind joining us up here? We'll, uh, we'll see if you guys have got any hard questions for us. Um, <laughs> we already have some questions. Do we have some questions? The Zoom, uh, we have <laughs> Um, I'm going to stand up, so please just to make some space for you guys. Um, <laughs> All right. Thank you. So we'll just take a couple of questions from the audience on the internet first. On the internet. <laughs> How old do I sound? On the on the interweb on Zoom. Uh, so the first question I can see there is, Zerop is regulated in Switzerland, which is not part of the EU. How can they do transactions for real estates in the EU? Uh, it's really quite simple. So the solution that we provide 
can work pretty much anywhere as long as there is not a financial sanction action either against the individual or the country that we're receiving the funds from. A property transaction, as you will all know, can take place between any parties and is not restricted mostly by geographical boundaries. So it doesn't matter that Xerof is regulated and licensed in Switzerland, we still service global clients. Uh, and to Evis, yes, you can ask questions uh, by just by writing them in the chat, but be polite and don't use swear words because everybody's going to see them in the audience. So a couple of questions just to, to kick these guys off. And I'm going to stand up here because I'm already short enough. It is. If I sit down, you'll just see a pair of glasses on the top of my head talking to you. Um, so the first question I've got is to do with the appeal of Cyprus. Now, I've been to Cyprus quite a few times to work, to holiday. My wife is Greek and Spanish. So I say this with a good amount of humor. Why should anyone bother coming to Cyprus as a digital nomad? Just what's their appeal? I know you guys all know, but Kyriakos, I'm wondering if you could just give your perspectives on what the appeal is of Cyprus in particular to you know these relatively young digital nomads coming to be able to work from anywhere. First of all, thank you very much for, for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to, to be among you here today. And uh, to be honest with you, during your speeches, I've actually learned uh, quite a few stuff myself. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and now uh, going to the stuff that I claim to know a bit better. So Cyprus has historically been uh, one of the, let's say, uh, most popular destinations for someone to, to move to, right? So there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, it offers um, a very high quality of standard compared to other destinations um, uh, in the area. Uh, and that includes everything from the way that, you know, from the lifestyle, from the way you can do business, from the way you can make money, but also um, stuff that these digital nomads suffer from while living elsewhere, like, how far do I have to travel when I wake up in the morning and stuff like that? So, and also on top of that, uh, it's our legal framework, which in the case of crypto as well, we are sometimes ahead of, of, of other countries of um, in our jurisdiction. I'm talking about the EU and of course the, the tax regime. So uh, you're coming into a country with a very, very favorable tax regime, especially uh, when you come from abroad. So actually it is the case that if you set up an entity here and you do business, yeah. Uh, you can actually benefit more than if you are uh, a Cypriot doing business here, which is something very unique about Cyprus. Um, but it is the case. Um, and also, if you combine this with the robustness of the legal framework and also the fact that we are a European Union country with all the safety, security, and transparency that this uh, brings, it's only a few of the reasons why uh, I think people actually come. And then it's just uh, the what, what's the underlying factor, an investment. So... We talk about crypto and I always find it interesting that you have people that are used to very liquid assets like crypto assets and trading in crypto. And then you have people that want to invest in real estate, which is a way more illiquid, uh, let's say as a class. Uh, but it's true that if you check uh, statistics within the last few years, even in the difficult years of COVID, of uh, inflation and, and all these uh, things that happened in the past five, 10 years, returns, both in terms of rental, like rental yields, but also in terms of capital appreciation, uh, exceeded the expectations of, uh, of investors. And therefore, you're somewhere that you feel safe, you feel welcome. The taxation and the legal framework are clean and are very, uh, are those ones that invite you in. And also, you make a good money. So, to be honest with you and uh, myself, living abroad for about a decade in the States and in and, and, and London and ticking some of the boxes uh, in that group, I would say that I actually came here being a COVID, let's say, uh, repatriation mm -hmm. child, and I actually never left because comparing with what I was, uh, the, the situation that I was used to in California or in London or even Singapore, um, I actually find love here. <laughs> Very cool. And, and if I may add, sort of, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. If I may also add that, um, I do not think it's only the digital nomads that come to Cyprus and live. You know, Cyprus in general, it is an attractive place uh, to live and uh, work, raise a family. 
we have excellent schools and uh, it was re um, a recent study shows also that Cyprus is actually the uh, it has been ranked as uh, the fifth safest uh, country in the world. So I believe, but <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I'm already sold. Like I told you, you know, I, I love coming here. Yeah. Next time, maybe it won't just be for for eight hours. <laughs> um, could be for a bit longer. But the, the, the question that's really bugging me is, uh, and Harris, maybe you can pick up on this if you don't mind, is you know, from a legal or regulatory perspective, is Cyprus supportive of crypto nomads? Uh, you know, are there frameworks there that are clear and transparent? Or are, are we as crypto, as are, are I, as a crypto person, being persecuted everywhere around the world, including Cyprus? Well, you probably don't get it covered. Just to get your, just to get your brain, just to get your brain moving there. And then, when I do that, they are into the big parts and have to pay and no calls. Okay, look. Um, Right. If he poses any difficult questions to me, I will pass it on to him. By the way, why, why don't you address this question to Christiana and you address me? <laughs> I wanted to bring you in. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I mean, that's a good question. Definitely. And, uh, and uh, all right, from a legal point of view, definitely in Cyprus, we. Uh, we have a lot of things to 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 present to discuss with uh, uh, people that uh, they are either digital nomads or they are simply uh, you know investors or, or people that they simply want to take advantage of uh, everything that I was mentioned before, which is okay. I think that's uh, the the key selling point for our country for the outside world. And uh, there is no exception when it comes to digital nomads and, and in general, things having to do with um, innovation and technology. And always I'm talking uh, from the legal perspective, right? Because definitely having the legal framework in place is one thing. Having the proper, let's say, educational culture to, to develop this uh, framework or to promote it or to take advantage of it is, is something different, all right? At least this is this is my, my understanding. So, um, yeah, going back to your question, uh, I think, yes, it is, uh, as a country, we are very supportive uh, to this. Um, I think that the the problems that remain when it comes to crypto are the same that exist all around the world and I refer to, to banks and, and, and the financial sector in general. Uh, but definitely when it comes to regulation, mm -hmm. we have a very proactive regulator in Cyprus. Uh, I think that uh, that takes us to, to the most favorable jurisd EU jurisdictions uh, in terms of uh, licensing of uh, crypto asset service providers. Um, there is, and I'm talking now from my experience, there is an interest from, even from banks to learn about this. And I think that this is a, a, a good first step that when they start, at least listening about this stuff and pass through this, you know, education, it means that they are expecting the change uh, sooner or later. So those are indications that uh, things are about to, to change. I'm not saying how much, it could be a little change, but it doesn't matter. We need to see step forward. Besides, we are still in the uh, the very first stages uh, in this sector, but uh, I'm sure uh, we'll get back to this and, and discuss uh, more things based on, on the questions that mm. our audience will address later on, because uh, you both uh, did a very good uh, uh, 
uh, presentations and especially uh, listening to Christiana and the regulatory framework speaking about uh, real estate tokenization. I think uh, there are a lot of things to learn from, from this uh, idea of business, uh, I would say, uh, because this is not just about crypto transactions, it's more about technology. And when it comes to technology, you will not find a single person out there, even, a, even the most conservative banker, that mm -hmm. he will say that, uh, I don't want to hear about this. No, I mean, there are a lot of things to learn from, from tokenization. And, uh, and, and definitely the example of real estate tokenization it is something that um, uh, it's a good starting point, let's say, to, to discuss about this. Plus, of course, uh, whatever site technology is needed in order to have a holistic business model in place. Mm. There's a lot to unpack in, in there. Before we do that, I just want to look at the audience in the room and see, yes, sir, you have a question. Go ahead. Um, let me take the opportunity first to thank you for bringing all this information to us, serving it in a place, spending the time to gather all the information together. I'm uh, Costandinos. By profession, I'm a lawyer for the last 24 years. I have in my credit thousands of real estate transactions of a volume of millions, probably now to be billion, uh, if I just add them up all together. So you explain to us a very interesting way of using the crypto to buy a property. If I may ask you, where in which jurisdiction did you use this method? Did you use this in Cyprus? Because in Cyprus is only part of a transaction to have the crypto exchange into fiat and then to have the fiat accepted by the banker, which mark my words, irrespective of, of, of what you're doing, when the money will end up in the account of the, of the developer or the seller, the vendor, or whatever, the bank will take at least 15 days checking up the AMR, the source of income, all this stuff again and again. So it, it's, it's just a part of the game. It's a little bit, if I may say, premature for Cyprus, though we are very close, we are very near to that, uh, to that uh, a stage using, I mean, crypto buying property and combining the whole thing, the whole process of transferring the title deed uh, uh, with, with the payment, I mean, with the actual payment to the, to the seller. So question to you, do you also uh, offer services as an escrow agent? Because if you don't offer services as an escrow agent, probably you, you, your services will not be uh, uh, at the right time offered in Cyprus. You, you, we will not need you because we do have people that they have cryptocurrency. It's up to them to exchange the cryptocurrency into fiat and then to go find the seller and do the transaction. So you're getting into the game now. And you say, I will be a part of the whole procedure. I offer these services. So to my understanding and from my knowledge and experience, uh, uh, one question is, do you offer the escrow agents services or not? Or if you don't, how do you guarantee the transfer of the title deed from the seller to the purchaser? Uh, with the payment of, of, of the money at the right time to the to the seller. So it's it's one question. If 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 I continue just to uh, close my uh, it's very interesting what Christiana said about the tokenization. Actually, the tokenization, it is it is something that uh, I'm processing now in my mind because I know that holistically the whole procedure from A to Z to end up with a with a property or to develop a property or to offer something uh, to the purchases and some uh, smaller in the investors, if I may say, 
Actually, we're talking about Zedge, is, 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 is giving access to small investors in the game. So it's democratizing the whole industry. So it's going to bring a, a revolution. Definitely, it's going to be a revolution. But in order to be a revolution, you need to educate land registry department, tax department, the bankers to understand the whole thing. I mean, currently, the, the, they don't know, I mean, how to use this uh, tokenization. But anyway, the tokenization is, is so important that maybe Christiana can, can give us a few more examples, even though I have tens of examples to give you now with the tokenization. Already, I have processed the whole information. So the question is, escrow agents, if you offer this, if you have done something in Cyprus, probably probably not to be honest with you, but if you have done something in Cyprus, maybe you can share it with us. Sure. Well, firstly, thank you for your questions. I, I'm super happy that you found the topic of tokenization so intriguing. Uh, this whole area, I've made my life since 2013. And since 2013, for every one person who has ex expressed interest, I must have had a hundred who have said, you're a crook, you're an illegal, it's never going to happen, you're a dreamer, it'll be in 20 years. I heard exactly the same when I founded my first business straight out of university when I was selling fax modems. These huge boxes, they weren't inside computers then, you bought them separately, you connected them to power, you connected them to the phone line, and then you connected them to a computer. And all my friends said to me, Fax modems, why do I want to send faxes? I said, no, you don't understand. There's this thing called the internet coming. And it's going to allow data and information to be driven everywhere. That business was pretty successful. But I had to spend five or seven years listening to everyone, including all the local telco companies who told me it was illegal to connect a fax modem to the phone connection in my own house, tell me that it was never going to take off. I would say to your point, the time is now. This is not in the future. Cryptocurrency Bitcoin has been around 13 years. It's approximately a trillion US dollars. We are live. We have traded properties or supported properties here in Cyprus. We support the property, the purchase of properties using the same model I described to you virtually every day around the world from a few hundred thousand up to multiples of tens of millions of euros. So this is happening now. It's uh, back to what I said earlier, what we do is not complex. It doesn't interfere with the existing model. All we're doing is we're taking one currency and exchanging it into another. And we're sending it to the place where it needs to go, when it needs to get there. Whether that is then taken in custody, escrow, by a notary, by a solicitor, that's the process that's already established, as you quite rightly said. We don't interfere with that. What we make sure happens is that the currency, in whichever currency it needs to be, is in the right account at the right time. That's it. Do you also hedge the exchange rate? I mean, if someone is buying for one million euro, yeah. he's paying with, he's paying with, uh, with a with a crypto currency. Yeah. So the crypto is. Yeah, so I'll talk to that process a little as well. And I'll let Christiana come in to talk about the tokenization piece. We have a question online as well, which is very similar to yours. Uh, so they ask about who provides the liquidity to Xerox while the transaction is being processed, just very quickly, because this uh, EBIS online sounds as though uh, they're quite knowledgeable. We have a number of liquidity providers or LPs. So that's both very wide and very deep. And because we are all very experienced in this space, we're connected to just about every liquidity provider that could be needed in any scenario. And this question that came in online is around the risk of the price and why um, the process takes five days when really it's just a basic SEPA transfer. So let me just correct this individual online. The whole process takes approximately five days from the moment of us identifying a client to KY running the Know Your Customer, running the anti-money laundering, running the checks on the coins that are going to be used as well, because in crypto, you have to check the history of the coins. In fiat, you don't put special uh, ink on the notes to check whether there's any uh, drugs on them. I think I'm sure to be forced to do that, by the way. But in the world of crypto, we have to check the history of the token. So we do all that. 
Then we do the exchange and then we send the funds to where they need to go. And that whole process, onboarding, KYC, AML, exchange and transfer, takes approximately five days. The actual transfer itself for Evis takes, when we're doing, uh, you're right, when we're doing a bank to bank transfer, it takes just a couple of minutes. Um, so how do we hedge the price? It's really, really simple. We don't hedge the price at all. When someone says to us, yes, I'm going to buy this property for 22 million, you've got a copy of everything you need, including the contract of sale, so you can see why you're doing the exchange, you know where it needs to go. We go to the holder of crypto, we say, this is the price that we've got for you in the market at the moment, so spot price, completely transparent. If you want to go, you have a period of time where you give us instruction and we can hold that price and we go. We do the exchange during that period of time. And this is why people come to us because again, we've been doing this since 2013. For us, this is just like normal. It's for most of you, it's just like when you walk up to the ATM and you take 50 euros out before you go for a drink with your friends on a Friday evening, or you just tap your card to pay. Doing things like this is just like that for us. It's just what we do. We know how to do it and how it works. So when the money hits the account of the seller, or anyone who is uh, provided for in the contract because um, zero actually transfers the money where the contract indicates zero to transfer the money. So whoever is the, um, the party, then that is where the money goes. So if it is a developer, it goes there. If it is a lawyer, it goes there. If it is the escrow, it goes there. And, depending on the legal arrangement, on the legal relationship, we need to, we need to furnish a contract to zero. So zero then will follow that contract. It will, zero will honor that contract. They will follow what the clauses of the contract say. Yes, but unfortunately in Cyprus, you cannot simultaneously transfer the property and pay by crypto. But you can go to a land registry department because unfortunately we are 50 years back you are correct. and we have to attend the land registry correct. department in person. You are correct. Yes, yes, and just pass the uh, bank instruct Absolutely. from the seller to the buyer. And at the same time, the officer of the land registry department to read the transaction to you and you agree, yes, I sold my property and I'm paid. So th think of it that this way. way. Wherever true. you take the banker's draft, wherever you draw the banker's draft on, that bank account, those funds could be charged using the exchange that we've made. Okay. We that's, don't that's why I said the escrow. Yeah. Because if you if you act as an escrow agent, no, we don't. Uh, but uh, the seller will be much more comfortable to transfer the title deed and reply to the tax to the land registry officer mm. at the question have you get paid yes i uh, yeah can I, can I say that i mean um, okay, this is a prediction i would say uh, this is why at some point lawyers that they would they do this on a regular basis and it makes business sense for them to 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 provide this escrow, crypto escrow service, they would all apply for CASP license. And they would all have CASP license in order to provide crypto escrow service. And if we go, if we may go a, a further step, we follow the procedure of a blockchain transfer of the title deed within the blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we but this to... is what is provided in the, in the, in the blockchain policy in Cyprus. It's just is delaying. Yeah. Hopefully, it will not that's delay a, longer. That's but that's a hope. I, I believe. I believe that what Gostandinos is touching upon is uh, the adoption part, mm. because without the adoption of cryptocurrencies by the various entities, not only people in general but also governmental entities, then we're not going to see much. I believe uh, happening. They have to adopt it, but in order to be uh, to be able to adopt it, we need awareness and education, and on top of that, we need standards, and so on, that everybody. And on top of that, we that. need digital policy, and exactly. on top of that, we need digital strategy. 
And on top of that, we need um, user-friendly in uh, interfaces. You know, the technology is not as mature yet yeah. to give access to everybody. I mean, it's right now, it's only the people that are actually involved in cryptos. And if we look in what is happening with crypto adoption, uh, Crypto.com, they say that uh, around 300 million uh, people all over the world, they own crypto. But by just owning crypto and keeping them somewhere in a wallet, it doesn't mean that we actually use them. So uh, this is what we need first in order to be able to see this wide adoption and all these different transactions taking place. So we are... Now in the beginning, we uh, it's like we are we're laying the foundations for everybody else that yeah. will be following afterwards. Yeah, so, I'm yeah. just going to move the conversation on because this yeah, gentleman up here is going to get a sore yeah. arm from having it up in the air. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I, I tell you what, have an arm wrestle for it. Whoever wins goes first. <laughs> My name is Amir, and firstly, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm really interested in the tokenization part. Thank you. Too. Uh, as I as I really believe it has the potential to open up the real estate industry and even completely transform it. What I'm curious about is um, what are the main hurdles for this sector to gain adoption, and how does Future State Alliance plan on? Like, what is the main hurdle to be, before we to before get yeah? What are the main hurdles to, to, get, to get adoption? To adoption? Yes, Before we do that, could we take the question at the same time from the gentleman in the red shirt at the back? Thank you. We'll uh, take two together. Actually, pink shirt. Um, pink shirt. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I got a red shirt. You're pink. Sadia <laughs> Shevin, okay. um, also from the MSC and blockchain digital currency. Uh, my question is, uh, you were talking about um, having an exchange, launching an exchange. What kind of what amount of volume would you expect from such an exchange for real estate tokens, and what sort of auction systems would you use to account for whatever level of volume you expect? Super, thank you. So I think we, we Christiana will pick that one up. Uh, I, I think because that's more to do with the tokenization model, right, of of real estate. Let's go to the the question first that came from gentlemen. What are the frictions? What are the main frictions? I think. Yeah, and in particular, I'm curious how future state aligns. That was the name of the mm -hmm. plans on that. Okay, to, um, to be honest, today, this event, this specific event, it, it is not about the Future State Alliance, uh, but anyways, since you put the question regarding tokenization, I will say, as I said, tokenization is one or only one of the opportunities offered by blockchain, by the crypto world. So tokenization hurdles, I will share with you what is the hurdle now. The hurdle is the following. We tokenize, we fractionalize, we tokenize whatever real estate or any other luxury asset like we do currently with Gadamaran that actually they go around the GM and, and they clean the GM. We tokenize them currently as we speak. And other like sheep and luxury items real estate items and um, high value, high value tangible items, I would say. Well, oh, I, I, will, I, will, I will share the hurdle with just one example. We tokenize one building and then we get, let's say 500 people, uh, individuals, retail um, uh, buyers, investors, and they buy the tokens. If the property is on a company, it means that we actually, what we do is we tokenize the shares or the bonds. In this case, we would need, as soon as the buyer purchases the shares, to do what? To make the necessary arrangements with the register of companies to transfer the shares into the new buyer, correct? Yes, because they need to change ownership. So if we do that, it will take us ages, as you know, because of the authorities. It takes time to do that. If this takes time to do that, what is the problem here? Soon we're going to have the DLT pilot regime. The DLT pilot regime is a regime in the EU that provides that. When I tokenize shares, I'm the developer, and I tokenize shares, and I give it out to buyers, to investors. 
these investors are allowed to list these security tokens. These are not cryptocurrencies in the meaning of payment tokens. These are security tokens. In this case, they are allowed until the end of the year, this regime will be here. The, the content of the law is ready. So we will see secondary markets. Okay, in, on the secondary markets, we will um, list the securities. It will happen so fast that these securities will be traded from one investor to the other, from one investor to the other. How is the register of companies be able to respond since the register of companies is not digital, is not on blockchain. They cannot support the transfer of these shares from, sh from hands to hands to hands. So what we do now is that we structure other arrangements. So we structure other legal arrangements that are completely legal and very compliant. And we do that in a way that this is not really the time to share. There are so many different arrangements, like we use SPVs, special um, purpose vehicles, vehicles, and then we use mother companies, we use nominees, we use trustees. So you, most of the times, what we do is like, we provide that the tokens hold all the rights and interests and duties that the share, the shares have, but, but in, in one case, like this one scenario that I'm sharing with you, we do not provide for the transfer of the shares, but we have like another company holding the shares the whole time. So the company would be there holding the shares the whole time. For, for this, for the time being, later, when we get to see these register of companies becoming digital and the shares change hands very quickly and the, the shares would need to change hands so quickly in the register of companies as quickly they change hands in the secondary markets. Otherwise, we won't be able to do it. So this is the main hurdle I see in this case. This is the main hurdle I see. But regarding tokenization, have in mind that we can tokenize part, even part of the property. For example, one developer could say, I keep the half and I tokenize the half, the other half. I keep the 75%, I tokenize the 25%. I tokenize the 10% in this way, the 30% in this way, the 40% in this way. So there are different legal arrangements to tokenize for the same property. So it depends. So, what I want to be, uh, what, what I want to assure you about, and I know people online listening, and maybe authorities are listening, and the government is listening, and I wish that they do listen right now, is that the, the regime is here. The regime is here. These are security tokens. So we do have, Paris, yes, we do have the. They will probably have this most of those people that you mentioned, right, when it comes to crypto, the only thing that they want to respond is that no, 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 money on this. No money on this here is not involved, and we can guarantee that. We can guarantee that. So each time anybody buys security tokens from any platform, when we onboard them, we do full KYC. Full KYT, mm -hmm. full in travel rule, everything we follow, so everything is compliant. Um, I think that uh, Harris has raised a very good point because um, recently one of my students, he was doing some work on uh, tokenization actually, and we just uh, finished a paper on uh, um, identifying all the different advantages and disadvantages when uh, on tokenization. And uh, he had a questionnaire going around asking in potential investors if they would uh, invest in it. And uh, the response that he got from many was that, what, are you doing some sort of a scam now? You know, are you a, fraud, a fraudster? So even when we were trying to do research, they considered it as, as if it was fraud. Um, if I may add, um, so um, talking from the real estate, Mm. aspect only now, man. So real estate uh, is a business of concrete, right? 
and that's concrete once it sets into an idea uh it moves difficult see there's a little difficulty involved in moving it and it doesn't change shapes very often right and it's difficult to do so however what we all agree is that what makes the world around is matter right so from my perspective we live in an environment at least in cyprus where most of the properties are sold offline okay namely because of high demand namely because there is a um, shortage of uh, labor or, or construction material the reality is that most of the things are sold offline so the reason i'm saying it's because it's one thing to facilitate the transaction it's an, and it's another thing as you very well asked to bring the money in cyprus and unfortunately we are in an industry that the money needs to come to Cyprus because you need to actually physically build something, right? Yeah. Now, even us, the dinosaurs, as you said earlier, the, the concrete guys, the ones that move slowly, realize that at least all the transactions that I've been part of, um, don't call me that, um, <laughs> I, what I realize with the limited knowledge that I had before uh, coming back is that, in fact, as Christiana said, actually doing KYC on um, Creature related transaction is way more robust and way more thorough than anything else. Why? Because of market. Because people have made us believe that if I own Apple shares and I have one Apple, sorry, one million worth of Apple shares and I sell them, that's enough. Why is it any different if I have one million worth of Bitcoin or Ethereum? Why is it any different? Wouldn't I still need to go one step back and ask, how do you get it? And where does that end? So uh, I think. Problem one is to actually educate the banking system, which fortunately, unfortunately, is still um, the foundation of economy in, in countries like Cyprus about it. And the fact that actually it could be more robust and more clean for them to do it effectively on the crypto world rather than in the fiat world. And it's actually not that difficult to do so. And if you don't want to educate yourself, and I'm a CEO sitting in my chair and I realize there's a huge market to take, like hire people that they do know how to do it. And that, you know, you pay a bit more, but it actually brings you a lot of money. So that's number one. Number two, you talked about tokenization. And I very well agree with you that um, the reason that this is a technology, otherwise it's just speculation, right? Otherwise, if everybody wants to invest in Bitcoin, it goes up. And if everybody doesn't, it goes down, right? But what we're missing here is that it all started from Bitcoin, but what made it a huge success is the technology. So it allows you to create stuff like um, uh, smart contracts, right? Mm -hmm. And it allows you to create stuff like everything is clean, transparent, and you can follow everything in speeds that it's not so typical of human beings, right? So my background comes from high frequency trading, um, and I'm used to trade hundreds of thousands of contracts a day, not something that is uh, possible with an average human brain, not even with mine. Um, and so um, is this technology that unfortunately, because ma the marketing around crypto world is still bad, that people have convinced us that, oh, crypto, money laundering. When in fact, if you actually know how to do it, it's way more transparent than, uh, than normal fiat transactions. And so, in my humble opinion, number one problem is the banking system. And I don't think it's because they don't get it. It's because ever since um, 1960s, there's a huge effort moving money from manufacturing, moving money to money. You want to make money, you have to be in money. And you're trying to convince this system that has been a very centralized idea that decentralized exchanges is the future. It's not that they don't know it. I think it's just that they're afraid of it. And that's my humble opinion. I'm just going to see. Yes, I'm just going to see if there's a sweep of questions in the audience, just for a little pause to give you guys a chance. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Anthony. Uh, I have a company uh, that developed the platform for tokenization in the United States. Uh, it's a really interesting market, good experience, and it's clear how to do this from the uh, regulated perspective. But the uh, European market is rather interesting for, for this uh, uh, perspective. And I would like to know if there is any regulation uh, sandbox uh, where can we br bring together with the other uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, and developers uh, and uh, 
um, regulation uh, authorities uh, to um, find their solution because uh, we have a good experience from the United States market uh, and from Middle East market as well. Uh, and um, uh, if uh, there's any opportunities uh, to collaborate, uh, maybe a future state alliance uh, for this purpose. Uh, so um, how how is this uh, work really here? Um, if I so, yeah, if I may actually just to say regarding the sandbox, uh, we we are currently working on creating one an EU sandbox. I um, mean, um, in collaboration with uh, a couple uh, with uh, some other companies uh, in Europe and some other experts in uh, creating this EU sandbox. And actually, there is a call uh, for use cases. Um, we can talk about it afterwards and give you the links, uh, the relevant links to look and into. In Cyprus, yeah. uh, for Cyprus, I'm not aware. This is for the EU in general. Well, there is an initiative taken from uh, the Cyprus Security and Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. right, to, to set up a sandbox. Actually, they, they run a preliminary uh, discussion with various stakeholders and then the, uh, in order to I don't know the issue the tender as yes. well the tender as well mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think that there is uh, no progress yet I mean we don't have anything being established it is still in the in the process but the tender closed on the 15th of February yeah yeah so hopefully it was good that you came along today so that I can connect you with the people that be. And if you want to, I spent two and a half years working with all the guys in the European Commission, and European Parliament, which is why I look so goddamn old. I can connect you with anyone that you want to, but be aware they move slow, real slow. Well, there was a question to move fast. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's where that's where the challenge will come actually, back to the regulatory piece. Uh, and it's back to this conversation with this gentleman here at the front. The industry is ready to go. We're doing transactions now. This isn't a discussion about the future. It's not a discussion about Monday. It's not even a discussion about this evening. I keep glancing down at my phone because we have a transaction that's closing right now for a lot of money. People are doing this. So either, I, I told a story inside of the, the European Parliament. Do you know how to kill a frog? So you take a frog, you put it in a pot of cold water, put it on a stove, and you turn the gas on. The frog will sit there until it boils to death because it doesn't realize that its environment is changing. So my message to you guys is don't be frogs. The world is changing. Don't sit in the water. Don't get boiled to death. Don't die. Move now. There was a question over there. Yes, hello. Uh, I'd like to thank you for putting forth very interesting points, not just for the presentation sake, but Make sure that the framework points uh, either abroad but domestically as well. Uh, I'd like to point out that there is uh, emerging markets uh, that are happening right now, just in just in terms of sustainability. There are energy projects. Uh, one example is Energy Shift from EU. It's a project where it's tokenized, where uh, everyday people can purchase their tokens. This company can buy land, uh, install renewable energy, and solar panels and windows, and then use power to sell it, and the, the, the return uh, dividends for the company. Uh, these emerging markets that are happening right now will require uh, the real estate tokenization as well because you will need to catch up. Uh, would you say that this is my question, would you say that you would be able to provide services like this for these companies, emerging companies that do you know for energy resources, uh, uh, for you know, some countries and stuff uh, as a means of buying land to provide Service. Is your question more generally about the technology being able to do it? Uh, no, I'd say would you uh, 
we this company was one of the that came out in the different countries so we could have a conversation because it's not the focus of our business for today which is purely around the exchange to support real estate transactions but that could be something that we look at from the advisory side of our business where we work in lots of institutions around the world to help them understand exactly the tokenomics models the technologies because that is what we do I've oversimplified our business because I wanted you all to understand that we exchange crypto to fiat to support a contract. But in essence, we're all tech guys. We've spent 12, 15 years funding projects like this, earning money from projects like this. And again, this is all happening now. Renewable energy credits being traded in reality to try and achieve sovereign independence of energy, particularly important given what's going on. It's happening. This is not in a week, in a month, or when the EU decides to put the framework in, it's now. Okay, not on a huge scale, but it's real. Other questions? Come on, ask us something difficult, guys. What about all the scams? Do you want to hear whether we're all scammers? What will we do about the market? Why are people doing all these bad things? No? You don't care? <laughs> so... Can you explain in easy words what are the main advantages of using the blockchain for real estate? So that's simple short words. Real estate in which context? I like to use a different transaction, like doing all the stuff on the blockchain. <laughs> so doing all the, the stuff. Main advantage of using the blockchain technology for this real estate transaction. So think of uh, blockchain technology as an efficiency tool, and high, high efficiency because you could. Exit, you could program certain actions to take part mm -hmm. at certain times and if certain conditions are met without humans needing to intervene. With, uh, well, to a certain extent, you don't, but by uh, at the same time, also having trust that the process is going to work can't be interfered with or overridden by other people. Where does this trust come from? Um, so you said simple terms. I mean, uh, we, we could go yeah, into... Okay. We, 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 we could... So there are many... Yeah, you're right, actually. But from the, no, it's, so block, there are many different types of blockchains. Some are centralized, some are not. The centralized ones tend to be under the control of an identifiable group of companies or individuals who make the decisions at a consensus level about how the project will move, what the key parameters for that particular blockchain will be, what technology it might use, what service it sits on, where the servers will be based, for example. And then there's open blockchains like Bitcoin, where nobody controls that. It's open to anyone to join, anyone can take part in it, anyone could submit code to be peer reviewed, and anyone can try and make suggestions. There is no central controlling body. So within those two outer limits, closed and completely open blockchain, the conversation is a bit more complicated because there are different values for different types of blockchains. And what problem you're trying to solve is a slightly different discussion. But the question of trust is a really interesting one because I, I have a fundamental problem with parts of our industry, parts of my industry, when they say you trust the code. This is the line I get, get back from people and I say, why can I trust this? Why can I trust this? Because you trust the code. It means you don't have to trust humans. But the last time... No, but the problem is the blockchain is a closed system. So you know, even yeah. for any type of tokenization, you can take the blockchain onto the chain. Bitcoin is not, as an example, the world's largest blockchain. Bitcoin is not a closed system. It's entirely no, open. I mean, if you want to get external data, like the USD price, code, whatever. Stock yeah. market, the house, whatever, any kind of data which is not stored on the blockchain. When you need to get it on it, yeah, you need some kind of storage, like yeah. chain link, for example, something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or you need to trust the file, which is kind of what you do. To a certain extent, which brings but... me back to my original question if I need to trust the party, if I need centralization, everything, where is the advantage of using the blockchain for this transaction? <laughs> I think you, your question is very broad. I think I understand the 
almost philosophical point that you want to make. And I think I'm in agreement with you, actually. No, but I have the point as well. I mean, the blockchain is the most inefficient data structure we ever had. And do you know the other branches of decentralization? Do you know polychain? Are you familiar with polychain? Yeah. So I, I fundamentally question your comment there if you look at it through the lens of polychain, because it has the highest transaction throughput, has the least consumption of energy. Compared it, to other blockchains, but if you compare it to a centralized database where it needs the same level of trust, mm -hmm. every blockchain, because you have to write, you have to write some hashes, you have to do packages, it's the most inefficient data structure ever. I, I don't think I agree with you. Of the blockchain. But mm. if I have to trust you. Mm. Yeah, so the, I'll, uh, cause I think we're going to disagree and maybe we're going to bore most of the audience here trying to get to the bottom of firstly the question and then secondly the, the discussion. But I'll offer you something in a conciliatory tone, which is I kind of agree with you from one point because trust the code only works if you can yeah, identify yeah. how the code has been written. Because code just doesn't come up from the ground. It's created well, by humans. Just the code, I guess. Nobody. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think, think we have a point of agreement there. But on your point about efficiency and security and comparison to existing systems like C++, which supports most of the banking systems around the world today, I think there's an enormous, I think there's an enormous efficiency gain. And you don't have to bring people out of retirement and pay them a million, five million, two a month because there are only 20 coders left in the world. So I think there are lots of efficiencies there. And I'd, I'd like to continue the discussion with you, but maybe not at the, the cost of everyone else's attention. Okay. So. Hello. So, yeah, it's me, Chris. And uh, we have the chance to talk about all the stuff we have in the discussion. And I'm very interested for the discussion about the organization and the and the so uh, my question is not really focused on the source of funds uh, i would like to ask how do you guarantee that the source of funds for that specific owner that owns uh, let's say the new planes are safe if you do that do you take the responsibility of having that let's say guarantee when the process will continuously at the moment, let's say, for example, that they uh, will be able to process the transaction. So, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking how far back do we go on the source of funds? Of course, and based on that, you have any, uh, probably will have a specific methodology where you will, uh, let's say, create that this specific wallet, for example, let's say, you take the responsibility. How do you manage basically? That that specific wallet is safe, and if you do that, do you have any specific tools for doing that? So we do have specific tools. We use a number of industry-leading tools, and we spoke earlier about how I was part of the team that built one of those what is now industry-leading analytics tools. Uh, how far back do we go? That depends. It depends on the initial information we get. If it's relatively clean, it can be five to seven transactions. If we have suspicions, then we might go back even further uh, and look for signs of mixers, tumblers, and things such as that. To your point about source of funds, yes, we do regular source of funds check, which is more crypto friendly than you might imagine, because many people that come to us have got a very large holding in crypto, high net worth, ultra high net worths, and they're very private. They don't want to reveal too much information. So we've developed techniques, systems, processes, and partnerships that allow us to get the right level of information without being too intrusive on privacy, but that will support the transaction to demonstrate that A, it's legal, B, it's compliant, and C, most importantly, it will happen when we send it to our bank to send to another bank, and the banks don't put red flags up. I think we might be just about nearing the end of time. So what I'm going to ask each of the panelists to do for you is to, in three words, and I'm talking very slowly to give them a little bit of time to think, in three words, summarize what they believe are the most important points for this industry, if the industry is real estate and crypto, to be able to reach mainstream adoption. And so I'm going to take the wind out of your sails because your three words can't be education, education, Oops. education. <laughs> Harris, let's start with you as I've just taken Silda's answer off that. Four words. 
Is that okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> know your crypto client, KYCC. Nice, like that. All right, because when it comes to a mainstream adoption, as you mentioned, all right? Um, apparently, <coughs> uh, the more uh, technology we have in order to monitor sorts of funds and uh, be able to um, trace, you know, the crypto crypto transactions. Uh, it means that in the end of the day, uh, maybe people like financial institutions, regulators, will be more comfortable to propose, you know, this uh, this business and and and, and accept it. And uh, this is not something that has to do only with regulated businesses. And I will give you a very simple example to, to explain why I believe this is very important. You know that um, the major uh, fear, I would say, for people that, for businesses, right? Lawyers, accountants, uh, businesses that they want to transact in crypto is to make sure that uh, they will not uh, have their wallet becoming dirty in the end of the day, right? So uh, although there are not rules at the moment, there are not uh, regulations forcing the companies to run uh, crypto wallet checks, uh, I think that as a precautionary measure, they will soon find it useful to use these tools in order to be able to run uh, a check before they accept any such uh, crypto and give them the comfort that what is your problem now, it will not become my problem in the end of the day. And you know what happened with uh, after tornado cash and, and, and other cases where just out of you know, uh, revenge, they simply sent a very small amount to hundreds of thousands of, of wallets just to make them dirty because they, they sanctioned tornado cash. Dust infection. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Harris. That was more than four words. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 I started with four words, but I didn't say that as a, a note. Okay, <laughs> okay, like a true lawyer. Disclaimer, yeah. huh? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, this... uh, man, uh, um, don't be afraid, actually. Don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid to learn. Don't be afraid to educate yourself. Sometimes you find things that you like or you don't like. Parts of the technology are more transparent than others. I can tell you from as someone with coding experience, but sometimes you need more transparency and sometimes you don't. That's why you have atriums or you have closed doors. So it's just the way of you use the technology if you understand it well enough. But if you don't care to understand it well enough, yes, you do need to trust somebody that does, but don't be afraid to learn something new. Internet used to be something new. Fax machines used to be something new. Part of that technology stayed and part of that we throw it out of, of the window because we don't need it anymore. But that's the my gist. Yeah, Thank I you. agree with Harris and Kiriakos. And I would add to Harris KYCC, he said. Okay, KYCT as well. Yeah. So it's know your crypto client, know your crypto transaction. Yeah. And then education, of course, I do agree because, anyways, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an approved trainer and I train people on this uh, regulation tech regulation, but also boldness. Boldness, because otherwise you, we're not going to do anything. I mean, you have to dare. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And finally, but by no means least, our wonderful host, Sula. Well, I'm not going to mention education again, because <laughs> this is a must. Education and awareness, standards, technology maturity, user-friendly uh, user interfaces. That I agree with. Yeah. How many of you have tried to use MetaMask or have a MetaMask wallet? How many of you love it? Uh -huh. Okay. I find it super, super hard, super hard. I think until we make ourselves more accessible, 
we're going to struggle with mass adoption. Guys, thank you for your attention. Firstly, thank you for coming out. Please give a round of applause. To these guys. I believe there are going to be a few drinks yeah. uh, at the back. Yeah, please join us for some drinks outside. Thank, thank you very you. much, guys.